The police aren't coming. There is nothing illegal about a car across the road. I tried to tell them I had been threatened, that my place had been trashed. But it's... it's hard to explain. Ramblings don't come across very well over the phone. And I don't think they took me seriously. So, I'm taking some time to just sit down and put this all on paper. I'll try to collect myself. And then I'll call them again. If I make it that far, I don't know what to expect. It's all gone. But I don't know if that's enough. I know some of you have questions about what happened to creepy cars. I've seen the posts. I've gotten the texts. I'm telling you, this is it. This is what you need to know. Let's start from the beginning. I visited a friend in Indiana a few years ago. I was on my way to the supermarket when I walked past an abandoned house with a rusted-out car parked halfway up the driveway. The car just looked savage. It was missing a door. It didn't have a single window. And there was a very graphic word written with white spray paint on the hood. I didn't think much about it. It's Indiana. You see these things every now and then. But then someone stepped out of the house, some Ed Gain-looking bastard, coughing up a lung. He lived there. Not only that, he got in the tetanus-coloured rust car and started it. It was the creepiest shit I had ever seen, like watching a machine come back from the dead. So, yeah, I snapped a photo of it. I could never have guessed that thing would even start, let alone roll out of the driveway. I'm a bit of a car guy. What I saw on that Indiana driveway was a rusted-out 1961 Ford Zephyr Mark II, and seeing it like that was just tragic. So to share the pain, I uploaded it. Apparently, I wasn't the only one with a lot of opinions. This started a long thread. People not only responded but uploaded their own pictures. Pictures of everything from rusted classics that had been stripped and abused to videos of amateur Franken cars. Hell, one guy just uploaded an ice cream truck abandoned in a swamp. I swear I saw an alligator trying to get in the driver's seat. We started sharing these stories of trashed and creepy cars from all around the country. And soon, the world. Over the course of a few weeks, we sort of split off from a larger community and started something we called Creepy Cars. I was the main administrator. Yeah, the one and only. Creepy Cars was not just about funny and creepy content. It was about enthusiasm. Sure, we all groaned over the various hack jobs, but it was also a sort of collective mourning. There was a genuine interest in the content uploaded. And of course, there was passion. I was called in a bunch of times to moderate discussions on rat rods. For example, we had some internal jokes and themes. We had Don't Wrench and Drive Custom Job Fridays, New Year New Car posts, all in good spirit. We had this one thing where we posted the ugliest selfies of ourselves and asked people to post what kind of car it looked like we owned. This one time, a guy found his car posted and reached out to us about how he could fix it. We raised $12,000 for the restoration. So this is the kind of environment I put my time in. These were good, honest people. So when I saw this car, this random-ass rust bucket cruising down the road... I wasn't being malicious. It was just fun. Just a quick video. Nothing to think of. It was last May, Minnesota in springtime. I was dog-sitting Sally for a friend and decided to take a long walk by the river before it got too dark outside. All in all, about a 30-minute walk. Not too bad. And Sally was happy to get out for a bit. We were just about to head back when Sally started whining. She put her tail between her legs and cuddled up next to me. I looked around but couldn't see what had scared her. I brought out my phone. If it was a wild animal, I wanted a photo. Worst case scenario, I could call the police. Then I heard this strange metallic sound. It sounded like a rattling engine, like something had come loose. 
an engine belt slapping around. Bearings shot to hell. It sounded like a dying vehicle, and yet something came rolling around the corner. The first time I saw it, I was amazed it even moved. It looked like some sort of cartoon, something forgotten back in the 70s, possibly a pacer. It had this thick layer of mud spread out across the hood, covering a few forest green paint spots. There were lit candles spread out across the dashboard, which was the only light coming from the car at all. And in the driver's seat was this, I don't know how to describe it, weirdo, I guess. He had a black motorcycle helmet with a crude face spray-painted in white. He had this faux fur coat with a raccoon pattern and bleach white leather gloves. He was leaning back against the only seat that remained in the car, a seat that was barely anything but a rusted frame. I didn't even think about it. I recorded it going past me down the street. The driver was looking at me all the way. That large helmet slowly turned to face me every inch of the way. I should have listened to Sally. She was pulling on the leash, trying to get away, whining, barking, throwing herself against the leash. She knew this was bad, really bad. But I just stood there, mouth open like a fish out of water. I had no idea what I was looking at. The last thing I saw as it rounded the corner was the license plate. How t d I could hear it going down the street five minutes after it passed me. When Sally finally calmed down, I carried her back home. I had a video to upload. The thing went viral. It spread from our little community to pretty much everything. 56,000 upvotes on Reddit in a couple of hours. People were reacting to it, adding music to it, making memes out of it. Hurt or D was all I heard about for a week straight. I saw at least a dozen They See Me Rollin' clips, all by different people. That was all fun and games, but I got this awful feeling in the pit of my stomach. When my buddy came to pick up Sally, she leapt into his arms, shivering. To her, none of this was fun. This was horror. Even two weeks after seeing the H0TR0D, it was still fresh on my mind. The driver had been staring at me, like they knew who I was, like they were there for me. And then that awful noise, like an engine trying to kill itself. It sounded like it was already broken, but it just kept rolling past me nonetheless. I couldn't make heads or tails of it, by all accounts. That car should be stalling on the side of the road, and yet it didn't. That night, as I laid awake thinking about it, I could hear something in my kitchen. Half asleep, I checked it out. My oven was on, the highest setting. There was an electric hum rising and sinking as the temperature breathed, and as the temperature rose... There was a rhythmic thunking sound that just kept getting louder. I hurried to turn it off, only to realize that it was already off. I burned my hands pulling out the oven, and I had to crawl over the countertop to pull the plug. For about ten minutes afterwards, I just stood there mouthing what the fuck over and over. It wasn't until I headed back to bed that I noticed the automated porch light was on. Something had moved outside, since then, things got worse. First, it was just small things. Clock radio going off in the middle of the night. Interference on my phone. Losing Bluetooth signal on my headphones. Small stuff. But over time, I started noticing other things. Lights flickering rhythmically in the supermarket. Ah, light posts fading in and out on the street. Car alarms going off, but warping themselves to go faster and slower, like a dying fire alarm. But the worst part came one day when I was driving home a few weeks ago. I had been at a restaurant with a friend in the next town over. I took the freeway back home when my radio stopped working. By now, I was getting frustrated. Electronics just kept freaking out on me, and I had no idea why. That 
and there was always that sense of threat looming in the air. There was always a sort of rhythmic pulse, like the hum of an engine, somewhere around me. I was just about to turn the radio off and on again when my engine stalled. Not just sputtered out, it just stopped. One big chunk sound, then nothing. I slowly drifted to the side of the road. Turning the key didn't do a thing. I was just sitting there, my head resting on the steering wheel. You can't live out here without a car, and everything just seemed to work against me. I snapped out of it by the honk of a horn. It was this water-damaged car noise, combining a bright, choking yell with a gargle. At first I didn't even register it. It sounded so strange that I thought I had imagined it. It wasn't until I heard it a second time that I looked up. Parked right next to me, door to door was none other than the H0TR0D, motorcycle helmet driver and all. He was parked so close that I couldn't open my door. I just stared at the black helmet. It felt like that childlike spray-painted smiley face was not just a painting, but actually grinning at me, like it was widening every time I blinked. The driver held up a white leather glove and pointed down. He wanted me to roll down the window. Not gonna happen, I mouthed back, shaking my head. Why was I scared? Why did I want to run? Almost as an answer to my question, the window started rolling down on its own. Yeah, no, no way. I wasn't having that. I crawled over to the passenger seat and opened the door, only to have it slammed shut. An outside force held the door shut, and the locks clicked. They kept clicking, over and over, in the same forced rhythm as the engine on the 80TR0D. This awful thunk noise, over and over, like someone beating a dead motor back to life. My radio sparked back to life. A static burst crawled into my ear, sending a shiver across my arms. Delete it. The sound was bright, pitch-shifted, and run through some sort of filter like an old 1940s radio receiver. I couldn't tell what kind of voice it was. It was just this bland, broken stutter. I don't... I don't know. The video? You want the video? Delete it. I can't just... It's already out there. Delete it. I can't. I can't. It's still going to be there. Get. It. Done. He didn't even have his hands on the steering wheel as the car pulled away. I could feel him staring at me from the broken side mirror. I just sat there, turning my car key over and over. When the engine finally woke up, it screeched, clunked, and complained. It shut itself off a few times, but it got me back home. The entire side of my car was covered in rust, and that car never started again. This was the first time I called the police. They didn't have a car with that license plate registered, so they couldn't do much to help. They didn't understand what I was talking about. Some guy angry about me putting up a video, pulling up next to me, asking me to delete it. How could I explain the threat? How could I make them listen? I asked the people at Creepy Cars as well. They didn't understand. It sounded like paranoia or some sort of science fiction. Cars don't just act on their own. They're controlled. My window couldn't have rolled down on its own. Radios don't just say whatever they want, and doors don't just slam shut. I was coming off as a lunatic, and people were starting to accuse me. You just want attention, they said. You miss having notifications. From this point on, it just got a whole lot worse. I was getting calls that answered themselves all through the night. Calls demanding me to delete it over and over and over. Strange engine noises going by outside at odd hours of the night. Lamps popping in their sockets. Hell, at one point my television turned on and kept looping half-second clips from the monsters. Didn't stop until I pulled the plug. It was getting harder and harder to get to work. At one point, as I was taking the bus, the damn thing just refused to start. Twenty people stranded in a parking lot. I had to ask a work friend to take me home. Thirty-five minutes in the wrong direction. This was by the end of last week. I have called in sick since. 
A few days ago I heard the porch light explode. There were footsteps outside. He was just outside, I know it. I was ready for him to bang on the door to peek in the windows. Something. I had grasped a hammer and hugged it like a teddy bear, begging God not to have to use it. But the driver didn't do a thing. Didn't knock, ring the doorbell, or peek inside the windows. He just stood there for the better part of an hour, waiting for me to delete it. At one point I just yelled at him, Just do something. What the hell do you want from me? Of course I knew what he wanted. He wanted me to delete it. I already had. But it was out there, and there was nothing stopping it from spreading. When he finally left, I felt tears rolling down my face. Just relief. I had been so tense my hands had cramped into claws. I could just barely let go of the hammer. Look, I haven't been out for a week. I've lived on literally everything in my fridge and freezer. Every leftover, every jar, all of it. The fridge shut down completely on Thursday. But by then, I didn't have much else than cornflakes and cup noodles anyway. Last night, I decided I would give it a go. I brought my hammer and went outside. Immediately, I heard a rumble. A broken engine. Then another. Then a lot. The H0TR0D was just the start. Six cars and a motorcycle rolled around the corner. These broken, battered machines. Flat tires, rusted frames, broken windows. Oil dripping from broken engine blocks. Howling engines, forcing these machine corpses to retch forward, one gasoline gulp at a time. And the drivers, all dressed in these black motorcycle helmets painted with these crude faces. Angry, happy, sad, screaming, the entire emotional spectrum. Dressed in these absurd jackets. Some fur, some cracked leather. One of them had this yellow crash dummy looking jumpsuit one pant leg torn off at the knee. One of them was missing a shoe, revealing a dry white foot with two missing toes and black nails. I just dropped my hammer. They were a goddamn gang. There was nothing I could do. I ran back inside, slammed the door, and picked up my phone. Of course, it didn't work. Open the door. It was a different voice. Brighter, spoken by one of the drivers. A woman, trying her best to sound as kind and patient as she could. But there was something there. A threat, just beneath the surface, trying to break through. Open the door, please. I didn't. I couldn't. My body wasn't responding. I was just slowly inching back, as if being quiet enough would make them go away. I found myself holding my breath, looking for a place to hide. You're going to open the door now. There was a gargling sound. Someone spitting up water, splashing against the door. Seconds later, I could see the door handle rusting in a matter of seconds as the whole mechanism fell apart. It took the door being battered down for me to finally snap out of it. The crash dummy driver was closing his visor back up but I caught a glimpse of a sickly pale face with a tint of algae green lips, long yellow teeth sunk into black gums. Then the visor was back down, showing a sad spray-painted smiley face. Crash Dummy stepped aside, and a small woman stepped in. She had this oversized motorcycle helmet with a cartoonish painted grin on it. She had this plastic silvery disco jacket and snow boots. If it weren't for all my lights being broken, she would sparkle. Should have opened the fucking door. Dig it? I just ran. I locked myself in the bathroom as they went to town on my furniture. I heard smashing, cutting, sawing, some power tools. Barely functioning. Little battery-powered machines coming back on to destroy. I just crawled into my bathtub in the dark pulling down the shower curtains as I stumbled back. I tried forcing air into my lungs, but I just couldn't stop panting. 
This is what Sally had felt like that first night when she saw the 80TR0D. I'm sure of it. Another door? Really? She cackled. This awful, bird-like sound. I could hear something in her lungs rattle. You're a fucking idiot. I heard a visor open, a retching gargle, and a metallic fizzle. Something loud, splintering the bathroom door by the handle. A small hand gently letting the light in. Careful steps coming towards me as I heard glass shatter in the other room. Why didn't you delete it? She asked. We asked you nicely. I... You can't. I saw the silhouette of the oversized helmet through the shower curtain. She wasn't moving. Not even breathing. I deleted the video. Video? She scoffed. What fucking video? I just froze. What the hell were they talking about? I did don't... What do you want? You stole our name. That's our name. What? She pulled the shower curtain off me and grabbed me by the throat. She had this cramp-like strength, like she didn't know how to hold back. I just started coughing, feeling these little bone-dagger fingers dig into my windpipe. Wicked little slug bugs, you think you got the creepy cars? You think you're it? I could almost see her eyes through the visor. I looked closely, but there was nothing there. Just darkness. We have creepy cars. You have minutes to live. I tried to say it. I tried it over and over. To say I didn't know. That I didn't... I didn't understand. I begged. I cried. I pushed and kicked. This impossibly thin little arm, barely anything but bone and sinew, holding me back. Somehow she heard me. She listened. She dropped a phone in my lap. An older iPhone, cold and wet to the touch. It had this mutated blue sunflower-looking thing as a background image. It was already logged in on my accounts. All of them. She watched me delete it. All of it. Creepy cars disappeared overnight from every single platform. Confirmed, confirmed, confirmed. Are you sure? The phone kept asking, and I shakily accepted all of it. When it was all said and done, she just took her phone back and left. My place is trashed. Even without a front door, I don't know if I can go out there. I've just sat here for the better part of a day. My computer started working a few hours ago, and I just... I had to say something. There's a rusty car in the field outside, and I'm starting to question if it's one of them. There's no one there. Maybe it's just a warning, or maybe it has always been there. I don't know. I'm questioning everything. I'm not going out there any time soon. Maybe it is over. Maybe it has just started. They left a black motorcycle helmet for me. It was my first night shift. Working extra at a gas station is pretty far from every boy's dream. But it pays the bills. I was hell-bent on not having another opportunity slip out of my hands because of money. One small investment and a move to Minneapolis, and I would have had a six-figure salary, but I just couldn't find the funds. So there I was, stocking the shelves at a gas station. Money is money, and there's plenty of future to go around. I figured. I had worked a few day shifts before, so I knew the place well enough. However, I had never been left alone for the night shift before. This was the first time I would be completely unsupervised. Jada, my supervisor, was about to take off for the night. She kept repeating the same instructions over and over. Then again, this place had huge turnover. Maybe she honestly forgot I wasn't that new. No phones, she urged. If you got a slow night, make yourself useful. Nod and smile. I decided to get the worst tasks out of the way early. Cleaning the bathroom. Restocking the freezers. Taking out the trash. Checking the receipt rolls. Watering the plants. Took me about an hour. It wasn't even midnight yet. And I was pretty much done for the night. I considered mopping the floor. But I figured I could save that for later. 
I had been useful enough. I was on my fourth game of teamfight tactics when I realized I'd forgotten my name tag. No big deal, really, but I figured I might as well fetch it. The manager's office was usually locked, but tonight I had the keys to it. I opened the door and started going through the drawers. Didn't take long to find the name tags. There was an entire box of them. At first I thought they were all blanks, but as I started going through them, I realized they were all previous employees. Sure, this place had high turnover, but this? We were talking a hundred people. Easy. This was ridiculous. I admit this is where I started asking myself some questions. During the day shift, there was always someone new, someone being trained or interviewed. I had only been there for about a week, and I was already feeling like a veteran. The only people who seemed to be regulars were the managers, Jada, Kennedy, and Alicia. They seemed decent enough, so why were so many people quitting? As I got back behind the register, I realized there was a customer outside, literally just outside the door. I waved at them. There was something off. They were just standing there, but they were so close that the automated doors should have opened, and yet the door remained closed. It was a man, late thirties, scraggly beard, rough red shirt, bit of a chunky look with sunken bloodshot eyes and a natural frown. He just stared at me. I waved at him again, but I got no response. Can I help you? I called out. Nothing. Not a blink. I pulled out a chair and sat down. The man stayed outside, looking in. I tried not to think about it, but it was bothering me. I couldn't see his car anywhere on the cameras, and he didn't seem to want anything. I couldn't tell if he was on drugs or just being weird. I gave him a few minutes, but he just stood there. Finally, I got up from my chair. Sir, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. He didn't seem to listen. He was a bit shorter than me, but he had a good fifty pounds on me. He'd be trouble in a brawl. I don't want to call the police. I said. Can I help you, sir? I pulled out my phone and held it up for him to see. I dialed the number and held it up for him to see, but still, nothing. Then my phone rang. Unknown caller. It was just past midnight. Without letting the unnerving man out of my sight, I took the call. Yeah? I answered. Please don't hang up, a voice on the other end said. You're in danger, and I can help. I was getting nervous. I wandered back and forth, watching those bloodshot eyes follow me. Who is this? I asked. I'm Angie, the voice responded. I used to work there. Same shift. Same managers. I wanted to warn you. I had seen an Angie tag in the box earlier. Maybe even several. She sounded young and nervous as all hell. In a few hours... Something terrible is going to happen, she continued. And if you're not out by then, you might as well be dead. What are you talking about? Look outside. I had been looking outside this entire time, but I had been entirely focused on this one man outside the front door. From across the road, I could see more people, about a dozen, lumbering out of the woods. I need you to leave, she said. Just walk out. Nothing will happen if you just walk away. Nothing will come for you. Who? Who are these people? What's going to happen? Look, she interrupted. It is perfectly simple. Just walk out the door. Something in me screamed for me not to do it. That I shouldn't step outside and walk past these people. They felt malicious. And I couldn't put my finger on why. Still, I stepped up to the door. Leaving seemed like the obvious choice. Strangely, it didn't open. It won't open, I said. Hold on. They... they want to keep you in there. They don't want you to leave. They want you to stay and die. Die? I asked. What do you mean? I stopped my pacing. Something was wrong. Was I locked in? Tell me exactly what is about to happen, I demanded. Something is in there with you, 
Angie sighed. It could be five minutes, it, it could be a few hours, but that thing in there is coming for you. And what thing are we talking about? The man with the bloodshot eyes had two people joining him, a young man with a grotesque overbite, and a young woman who could easily be mistaken for a child. All of them stared at me with the same broken eyes and rough clothes. They stopped, inches short of the front door. It doesn't have a name, Angie said, but it'll leave you empty. It'll leave you like the people out front. But if I leave, I'll be okay? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. Hold on, I'll check the back. I hurried out back to the employee entrance. I pressed down the cold handle, and the door swung open. Outside were another group of four people. Two young men, an older woman, and a girl no more than sixteen years old. They all stared at me. I couldn't tell if they were drawn to me or the store. I stopped short of stepping through the door. Why do... do they come here? I asked Angie. They serve their master. They want the spoils. What spoils? I thought about it. She was talking about me. Right, I said, nodding to myself. I see. Are you at the back door? Are you there yet? Yeah, yeah, I I'm here. Just walk out, she whispered. It's not too late. I was just about to walk out when a thought hit me. Why would they lock the front door, but not the back? That didn't make any sense. If the purpose was to keep me here, they could easily barricade the back as well. Something didn't add up. The door is open, I said. Great. You can still make it. Why wouldn't they lock the back door, Angie? She hesitated, and there was a brief pause. If they're locking me in here to hurt me, why wouldn't they lock the back door? I repeated. I don't know, she said. But you have to trust me. They gave me the keys, Angie. They go everywhere. I can lock and unlock this door a hundred times. What's going on? They... They don't usually do that. I closed the door and stepped back. Four less pairs of eyes staring at me. Look, said Angie. I was the last person to leave. They messed up. I found a spare key and got out before it was too late. Maybe, maybe they figured I'd warn you. Maybe they're trying to trick you. Sure, yeah, I chuckled. Convenient. I'm trying to help you, she cried out. Those things out there are to discourage you from going outside. They're harmless, but they're there to scare you. Can't you see it is all just a way for them to keep you in there? I got one person screaming at me to go outside and no one telling me to stay. No locked doors, just plenty of fucking creeps staring at me. What am I supposed to believe? Fine. You want more proof. Call the police. Hang up and call them. I ended the call. There were eight people out front by now all gathering outside the front door. I couldn't tell if they were trying to get in or if they were waiting for me to step out. I called the emergency services, only to be met with silence. Not even a dial tone, just a blank nothing. I tried a few more numbers. My mom, my friends. I tried going online, but all I got was cached copies of sites I had been to before. My background picture had changed to a black screen. But there was something else. Something had started to smell. The freshly stocked frozen goods had suddenly gone bad, and a stench was oozing out of the freezers. Our flowers by the counter had withered and died, all except the sunflowers, which had turned a sickly blue. I wasn't getting through to anyone. Being inside was awful. The single serving frozen meals were making me gag. I figured I'd go for the landline. As I got in the manager's office, I got another call on my phone. Unknown caller. Looking back and forth between my phone and the landline, I weighed my options. I chose Angie. How are you getting through? I asked her. How do you know my number? I still got the email password. 
I just checked your application. But how come your number works? Everything else is down. I'm calling from a private network, she said. They don't know there's a way in. They? I asked. I thought it was just one thing. No, they're working together. People don't just go missing without someone noticing. So there's like a... an intelligence behind it. A conspiracy. Yeah, people come and go in these places all the time. Are they paying you under the table? They figured, uh, it was sort of a trial and... No paperwork. No missing people. No records. Just a box of name tags. It made sense in a way. But I needed more. I needed proof. There had to be something. Why didn't you call me earlier? I asked. You could have called me as soon as I got the job, or, or as soon as my shift started. I had to make sure Jada wasn't around, she said. She would have tried to trick you. I'm not sure you're not trying to trick me. Why would I spend my time calling you from across the country just to have you fail? She screamed. If I was part of this, I would have just let you sit there with your goddamn team fight tactics and die. She went quiet. So did I. I counted my breaths as I looked outside. There were more of them now. How did you know what I was playing? I asked. She didn't respond. The silence hung in the air. I'm asking you, how did you know what I was playing? She was just as quiet as the man with the bloodshot eyes, still waiting for me outside the door. You're watching. You knew I was alone. You knew I was getting antsy about the guy showing up outside. Yeah, she sighed. You tried to get me out as soon as he showed up. You tried to trick me before there were too many of them to scare me off. That's... that's not... She sighed. I could hear heavy breathing. As I paced back and forth, I was getting ready to hang up. This was a trick. She was the one tricking me clearly, trying to get me outside to join those things. I know this looks bad, she said. I know. I'm sorry. I'm honestly just trying to help you. This time I was the one keeping quiet. I walked up to the door, studying the people outside. Blank stares, following my every move. I felt like a snake charmer, like they could snap out of it and tear me apart in the blink of an eye. As I said, I, 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 I have the passwords for everything. I'm the only one who knows them. I just wanted to give you the best shot at getting out of there. I hoped they wouldn't come tonight, but as soon as they did, I just, I had to do something. You're not being honest with me. I'm not lying, I'm just just having a hard time explaining it. There's a lot of shit about this that all sounds completely insane. I don't want to throw you off the deep end. Give it to me straight, I demanded. Tell me what the fuck is coming for me. It's not a thing, like not real. It's there, but it's just... I don't know how to explain it. It just steps through. Steps through what? The world the air, a ripple in time or, or something. It just steps in, and it's there. And then, then it shoves some kind of mouth spike into your head and gargles up something inside. A mouth spike. Yes, a spike. And no, I mean, ish. it goes into your mouth. It doesn't have a mouth of its own. It just goes into you and gone. Game over. I didn't know what to think. My mind was a jumbled mess, and I felt my pulse rising and falling. There were over eighteen people outside in various states of disarray, all of them just staring at me. If I just stepped outside, I'd know for sure. What does it look like? The lights flickered. There was a loud hum, a buzz, and then an electric failure. One of the fluorescent lights burned out while the others just slowly dimmed to nothing. This was real. It was make or break by this point. Um, something was happening. The lights went out, I whispered. Now! Angie screamed. Get out now! I ran. I tripped and tumbled my way into the back room in complete darkness. 
I almost twisted my ankle as I bumped into the lunch table. I could barely hear my thoughts, and I had to remind myself to breathe. The roof of my mouth ached, as if anticipating a piercing pain. I could feel my head filling with blood and adrenaline as my dry eyes refused to blink. As I put my hand on the back door, I did the mistake of pulling instead of pushing. It took me three tries before a thought hit me. I couldn't see the sign on the door because of the darkness. In fact, I couldn't see anything. Nothing. Uh, Angie? I wheezed, putting my phone to my ear. You there? Hurry! She screamed. You can make it. How did you see it? The thing was huge. It just... No, how did you... You see it in... In complete darkness. Y you said the lights went out. It was right there. I can't even see the sign on the back door. How the hell did you see a spike? Look, I... And to add to that, how the hell do you know what it does with that spike? You've never seen the thing kill. You said you were the last one to work this shift. And the thing sure as hell didn't kill you. You're missing the point, I... It doesn't add up, Angie. None of this adds up. You couldn't have seen it, and there's no way for you to know how it kills. I stood there in the dark. I heard Angie panting on the other side, matching my breathing. You're lying to me, Angie. You're not trying to save me. She stopped breathing. For about a minute it was just quiet. The call ended. A wave washed over me. I was either dead or saved. There was no in-between. I was moments from finding out. Every little sound shook me. A breeze just outside. A crackling wire. Ventilation struggling to turn back on. I hadn't even noticed my hand was on the door handle. You lied to me, I said out loud. You... you did. I caught you. There was a sound coming from the other side of the door. A shuffling of feet. Yes, said Angie. From the other side of the door. I must have stood there for an hour until the power came back on. The people outside were gone. Angie was gone. My phone worked just fine, so I called everyone and just cried for help. The police found me locked in the bathroom in a full panic, and I barely even remember being escorted out. Cameras had picked up a mob gathering outside, but that was pretty much it. They couldn't be identified from the back of their heads. Jada and the other managers were called in, and they seemed genuinely surprised. I've since looked it up. A hundred people starting and quitting their job in a place like that isn't uncommon. People come and go all the time. The managers honestly didn't know why people disappeared, it seems. Maybe this is just how things work. Or maybe there's more than one Angie out there, preying on short-term workers. And the front door. There was no conspiracy there. The thing just jams sometimes. Some kind of trouble with the wiring. If I'd messed with it just a bit more, the thing could have kicked wide open. That broken door was the only thing that saved me from joining them that night. I would have walked right out as soon as Angie asked me to. I worked there for another four months, but just day shifts and weekends. The night shifts seemed to go off without a hitch, though. Maybe Angie and her friends moved on from an easy meal. I've saved up enough money for my move to Minneapolis but I'd never forgive myself if I didn't put this into writing. Looking back at it, it feels surreal. There are things out there, things that want us to join them. I have a peculiar relationship with music. When I was a teenager, my mom and I lived in an apartment on Chestnut Hill over in Morgantown. Beautiful place, especially in the early summer. There was a basketball court, not too far from our balcony. Whenever I wasn't playing bootleg MP3s in my room, I was out on the court. But my most vivid memory of that place was of our upstairs neighbour, Mila. She worked as a waitress, but aspired to be a professional violinist. She had this curly, mocha-coloured hair that naturally framed her face, like a spotlight highlighting her cheeks. She had talked to all neighbours and they'd all agreed to let her practice her violin at certain hours of the day. Incidentally, I happened to be playing outside every day at that time. 
I had a perfect view of her from the court. I must have missed thousands of shots because of her. God, how I envied that violin. I had a huge crush on Miller. I used to come by every now and then to check if she wanted something from the store. I'd talk to her about her job, her violin, or whatever was happening around the neighborhood. One of the memories that really stand out was the first time she showed me her violin. It's real expensive, she said. See this? She pointed at the mark on the inside. G. F. Presenda. They don't make them like this anymore. Twenty years later, and that name still stuck with me. Presenda. So when I found a violin with that same name at a yard sale in rural Minnesota, I had to get it. It just sparked something in me. For a moment I was a teenager again, feeling my heart beat out of my chest, my skin tingling with excitement like it had done every time I'd knocked on Miller's door. I got it for about 800 bucks. It was a steal. Nowadays I live and work in the small town of Juniper, back home in West Virginia. I didn't get that far from Morgantown, but I can't complain. I can afford my own space, and I got a lot of friends that live nearby. I've dated on and off over the past couple of years. I'm good friends with my neighbors, and life is rolling on at a steady pace. And with this gorgeous Presenda violin, it felt like I'd found the last piece of the puzzle, that little tingle of youth, perfect for someone not too far from a midlife crisis. Let's be real, I'm getting there. I got it back home and cleaned it up. It had little balls of styrofoam stuck inside that seemed to have a life of their own. Every attempt at vacuuming it up just spread them out further. Annoying. But the violin was genuine. Hell, the thing was still perfectly tuned. A quick search revealed that this particular model was valued depending on the estimated condition. Somewhere around the $50,000 mark, if it was verified, of course, I'd have to get a certificate of authenticity from a collector or expert, which was a project in and of itself. Miller hadn't been kidding. These things really were expensive. That night was the first night in decades where I dreamt about Miller. I'd met many women over the years, but that boyhood obsession with Miller was imprinted in my very DNA. I dreamt about her sitting on the edge of the bed, getting ready to make her violin sing for me. I could smell the morning coffee on her breath. Her silhouette moved carefully, as to not wake me. You're gonna love this, she whispered and positioned the violin on her shoulder. She pushed a stubborn curl out of her face, raised the bow, and slowly turned to me. But no, I woke up with a sneeze. One of those little styrofoam balls had found its way into my nose. I was still clutching the violin like a teddy bear. Seconds later, my morning alarm went off. Great timing. It was the first day of the weekend. So I spent some time doing chores and talking to my friends online. A friend called another friend. And a friend of a friend called someone else. Somewhere down the chain of numbers and names, I ended up talking to a music teacher from Wichita. I sent them a few pictures of the violin, and they started laughing. Indeed, this was a genuine presenda, and from what they could tell, it was in great condition. I'll put you in touch with my brother-in-law, she chuckled. He'd love to get a look at that. Might even take it off your hands. But that planted an important question in the back of my head. Could I sell this? Had I bought it to make money? Or because I truly wanted to keep it around? Either way, I needed to have the option. So before anything else, it had to be verified and estimated. As the call ended, I stayed on the couch for a while. The violin was nice just to hold push it against my chest, feel the texture of the strings against my cheek. And as a bonus, it reminded me of her. 
I imagined her sitting next to me on the couch, an impossibly warm hand stroking my cheek. You turned out great. I could hear Miller whisper, I'm glad to be here. I smiled, even though it was my imagination, a phantom of the mind. I wept a little. I could feel her warmth radiating to my left. I didn't care that I was sitting there on my own. She felt real to me. It was decided. There was no goddamn way I was going to sell that violin. But even so, I was put in touch with a man called Waylon who lived up in Mount Morris. He'd gotten the pictures of my presenda and reached out about an evaluation. I couldn't bring myself to answer him, so I left him on red. Instead, I spent the day preparing the perfect wall space, placing the violin as the centerpiece of the living room. That night, after a long shower, I went to bed with a smile. I knew I'd be dreaming of her again. I hadn't been able to get her out of my mind. It gave me so much energy and left this warm glow in my chest just thinking about her, the kind of emotion I hadn't felt for years. I closed my eyes, and there she was. Rest it right here, she said, gently touching my shoulder. Your head needs to be laid backwards, relaxed, with half your cheek leaning in. I followed her instruction. I took the bow in my hand, drew a deep breath, and let myself relax. It was about ten seconds later that I realized I wasn't dreaming. I was really sitting there at the edge of my bed, holding the violin in a perfect grip. There was no one else in the room, but Miller had been there. My knees were covered in those little styrofoam balls. I shot up out of bed and brushed off my knees. The violin had been in the living room, hanging on the wall. Had I gone to fetch it subconsciously? I must have, but how? I ended up walking back and forth to the living room three times, trying to make myself remember fetching the presenda. I couldn't. It's as if it had just appeared in my hand. Maybe Miller fetched it for me. The next day, Sunday, I was in a daze. It felt like I'd slept for days and nothing at all. I felt disoriented and feverish, like I was coming down with something nasty. That, and I had to brush styrofoam balls out of my bed that morning. Damn thing was like craft room glitter. Had I put the violin back in the living room before I fell asleep? I couldn't remember. I had two more unanswered messages from Waylon. He was really interested in the presenda. Again, I left him on red. Instead, I made myself a cup of coffee, took down the presenda and listened. If I just relaxed enough and closed my eyes, I could hear Mila, as if she was right there with me, guiding my hands, whispering in my ear, making the hairs on my arms stand at attention. I'd love to play a little, she whispered. I'll show you. She showed me how to press down on the strings. She guided my hand, showing me the correct angle of the bow. Together we played a little starter song, a sort of lullaby. You know, the one about the sunflowers? I didn't even question it. It was this strange, awakened state somewhere between dream and reality. I just went along with it. I started telling myself it was just inspiration or a heightened sense of memory. Maybe I had a knack for music. I'd never felt particularly talented, so it was about time I found something. Suddenly it was past midnight. I'd been playing for fourteen hours straight. My fingers were red and raw, and someone was knocking on my door. Abe was a bachelor, in his early fifties, living right next door. He'd leaned heavily into the hippie aesthetic for as long as I'd known him. Long hair, rough beard, round glasses, and an oversized tie-dye hoodie. Hey man, loving the vibe, he smiled. Didn't know you could play? Sort of a new hobby. We looked at one another for a second before it clicked in my head. It was a work day tomorrow, and I was playing the violin. I hadn't even realized I was still holding the press sender, so I put it down. I'm... 
I'm sorry, Abe. No, no, it's fine. Seriously, I'd love to hear more tomorrow, yeah? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm gonna hold you to that. You've spoiled me now, you know. I'll keep at it, Abe. Thanks. All right, take care. He brushed some styrofoam balls from my shoulder, smiled, and wandered off. That night, as I went to bed, I could feel something warm pressing against me. Miller was right beside me, cuddling up against my back. I had fun today, she whispered. Can we play again tomorrow? Yeah, absolutely. You're learning so fast, it's incredible. It's a lot of fun. Everything? I thought about it. It was the exact word I'd use. Everything. Yeah. I sighed. All the good things. Um, let's call in sick, she snickered. Just spend the day together. I gotta work. One day is no day. You never call in sick. It'll be fine. You sure? I wouldn't lie to you. She gently kissed my neck. I turned to face her but woke up the moment my eyes met hers. I was lying on my side, holding my phone. I'd already composed a text message for my boss, telling him I was stuck with a bad cough. All I had to do was press send. The kiss on my neck still lingered. I sent the text. I spent my entire Monday with Miller. I played the violin and drank tea next to the kitchen window. I made myself a chicken salad for lunch and listened to Chopin while taking a bath. Miller was there with me the entire time, giving suggestions and encouraging me. She held my hand, stroked my cheek, brushed away my hair. She playfully tickled my ear, whispering sweet nothings. You're becoming your best you, she teased. I'm so glad we found each other again. That she wasn't real never crossed my mind. To me it was like falling in love for the first time all over again. I could only see the wonderful positives and my thoughts were completely devoured by the warmth I felt for that woman. Rose-tinted glasses don't begin to cover it. I played long into the night. At one point, as I finished an exercise for the tenth time, Miller squealed with joy. She flung her arms around my neck and threw herself at me for a kiss. Her soft lips brushed against mine. Then... She was gone. There was a knock at the door. I swung the door open. What? Abe took a step back, holding his hands up. Whoa, I, uh... Hey, man. Just checking in to see how you're doing. I'm fine. Great. That's... That's great. I'm just... Man, it's two in the morning. I looked back at the kitchen clock. It was actually ten minutes past. I was being a complete asshole. I'm... I'm sorry, Abe. I lost track of time. Hey, man, no sweat. Are you okay? You, uh, if you need anything or just want to talk, just come knocking. Least I can do. No, really, I'm... I'm good. I'm sorry. I'm gonna... I'll do better. I promise. Anytime, man. Just... take it easy. Get some rest, all right? Don't burn yourself out. He leaned in to brush some styrofoam balls from my shoulder, but changed his mind. Instead, he just pointed. You got a little something, uh? There. As he walked away, I brushed the styrofoam from my shoulder. Only then did I realize I was holding a kitchen knife in my left hand. Just in case, Miller whispered. I don't trust him. The next morning I woke up just after nine, still with the kitchen knife on the floor next to the bed. My alarm hadn't gone off and I panicked. I'd barely buttoned my jeans before I was out the door. I'd never been late for work before. The moment I plopped down in the driver's seat and put my phone on charging, I noticed I had a text. Turns out I'd sent a text message telling my boss I was going to be gone for the rest of the week. I'd blamed it on a throat infection. He confirmed it, asking me to let him know as soon as I felt better. I didn't send this, I said out loud. 
That wasn't me. A pair of warm hands caressed my shoulders. I figured we could take some time off, Miller whispered. Get to know each other. Play a little. You can't... You can't send texts, I said. That's impossible. And yet, there it is. She dug her fingers into my hair, massaging my scalp. Let's go inside. I couldn't say no. I just brushed the styrofoam balls from my thighs and went back inside. For the next few days, everything is a blur. We played, we talked, we cuddled. We watched a movie and random YouTube clips. And every step of the way, she was eager to let me know how appreciated I was. Her compliments were so warm and genuine. It wasn't just about looking good or being clever. She would make these deep, apt observations, things I never considered before. At one point I remember lying awake in bed, staring into the ceiling. The presenda rested on my chest, warm from use. Miller held my hand, stroking me with her thumb. I could smell her shampoo. Whenever I think of the future, I imagine myself facing a plain white door, she whispered. And beyond it, well, it's the most beautiful place. We should go there sometime. I'd love to, I smiled. You'll come with me, right? I'll never leave you. I turned to her. She leaned in close. I put my hand on her cheek, leaning in. Never, she repeated. Never, ever. I felt her breath on my lips. And then there was a knock on the door. This time I was enraged. I threw the door open and stepped out in the same motion. Abe fell backwards, landing straight on his tailbone on the asphalt. The anger just ran out of me like a popped water balloon. I... I'm sorry, I said. Abe, are you okay? Come on, man. I helped him up. He gave me an apologetic look. Look, you're... You're obviously going through something, he said. I'm trying to be a friend here, but I got work too, you know? I know, I know. I worry about you, man. Are you taking something? No, nothing. You sure? You... You like... Never sleep. Thinking back on it, I couldn't remember the last time I'd gotten a full night's sleep. And I knew for a fact I hadn't made the bed. It had been unused for at least two days. Speaking of days, what day was it? Thursday. It's not like that, I said. It's more like... I'm seeing someone. Oh? Abe raised an eyebrow. Oh. Oh, yeah, that... Uh, congratulations. Thanks, it's... it's been good. I'd love to meet them sometime. What's their name? Miller. Well, tell Miller she's a keeper, smiled Abe. Dusun. I don't know a lot of women who'd stand these little fuckers. The what? He brushed the styrofoam balls from my shoulder. You got, uh, termites. As Abe wandered off, I looked down. The little styrofoam balls were moving. How hadn't I noticed that before? Little white beetles, skittering along with their many legs. I hurried back inside. They were everywhere. They walked in lines across the floor, making the entire living room look like it was covered in long strands of thick webbing. They were in the cupboards. They were lining every inch of the floor moulding, and they were all over me. I tried to brush them off. They were in my scalp, my clothes, my underwear. I plucked one out of my eyebrow, and I could feel one trying to climb into my ear. I tore my shirt off, and suddenly they were gone. All I could see was Miller standing a few feet ahead of me. She took a step forward, and my body twitched. I could still feel them. I, I could feel them moving across my body. I just couldn't see them. All I saw was her. She put her hand on my cheek. It doesn't matter what is real, she said. You and I? That's what matters. I didn't have anything to say. I tried to find the words, but I wanted to jump out of my own skin. I still felt them. Then she kissed me. For a moment, all was bliss. 
warm lips pressed against me, careful but wanting, her arms wrapped around my neck. But this wasn't right. It couldn't be. I forced my eyes open. I was standing on all fours, lapping up insects from the floor like a thirsty dog. They were crawling up my legs, my arms, my face. I screamed, but felt something get stuck in my throat. Coughing, I forced myself into the shower. I had to get some of them off. I had to do something. I stepped into the shower, fully clothed, and put my hand on the faucet. Just as I was about to turn it, the light flickered. See, Miller was standing in the doorway, looking heartbroken. Get out of there, she said. Let's go for a walk. Let's talk. What the fuck are you? Nothing has changed. I love you. No, 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 no. I was just about to turn the faucet when I felt her hands resting on my shoulders. She'd been several feet away a heartbeat ago. Don't, she said. Please don't. I pushed her off and turned the faucet. Except I couldn't. My hand refused. I could see them moving under my skin. Pulse after pulse of squirming creatures acting as an impromptu blood vessel. My hand slowly turned upwards, on its own. My index finger contracted and released over and over. Look, honey, Miller whispered. I'm waving at you. I couldn't turn the faucet. Not with my hands, not with anything. I didn't even see Miller anymore, just the insects. And there were thousands of them. I hurried into the bedroom. Maybe I could just get rid of the press and da. Maybe I could set a fire. How hadn't I seen this? My bedroom was covered in them. They lined the walls, clumping into piles of squirming white. My pillows were so full of them, I could swear they were moving. And there, in the middle of the bed, was the presenda. Untouched, I felt a weight lean against my shoulder. It's beautiful, isn't it? Miller whispered. Just relax. Let me fix this. What the fuck are you doing to me? Whatever you want. I saw the insects evaporate from my vision, leaving the bedroom clean, warm, and inviting. There was this physical relief settling in my chest, and I could feel my breath slowing. See? she said. It's nothing. Something moved in my ear. In a moment of clarity, I clawed at it. I felt something scrambling to escape my fingers and pulled out the largest white beetle I'd ever seen at least as large as the nail on my little finger. I heard a scream, this awful, blood-curdling scream. Miller appeared before me, blood pouring out of her eyes, like she was crying her life out, teeth falling out of her mouth, like leaves from a dying tree. Her fingers curled into insectoid claws, her rib cage pushing forward, like an exoskeleton trying to overtake her. In a heartbeat, she grabbed my hand. The little white beetle dangled helplessly between my fingers. Put me back, she growled. Put me back. Let me fucking love you. She wasn't there. She wasn't really there. But she was still grabbing my arm, forcing me to lift the beetle back up to my ear. Little hair-thin legs squirming back and forth trying to get away from my fingertips. It just takes a few seconds, she cried. Please, just... It's all I ask. Seconds. I couldn't stop her. She was far stronger than me, in so many ways. But I spotted something. A chance. In one swift motion, I grabbed the kitchen knife lying next to the bed. It had been there for days. With one thrust... I stuck it straight into my arm. Blood and white grain-sized beetles exploded onto the bedroom carpet. The big white beetle dangling from my fingers landed on the floor, turning pink from the bloodshed. I looked up at Miller, covered in blood, her curly hair fighting to keep the volume against the viscous horror. I'll kill you, she snarled. If I can't love you, I'll fucking kill you. But her eyes betrayed her. She was scared. And I squashed her. I couldn't look. I heard bones break. 
skin tearing like snapping rubber bands, an involuntary death gargle, as if to get one last word in. The beetles were furious. Blood poured out of my cut, and I could feel my entire body itch from stings and bites. I couldn't see. There was a screeching in my ear, something moving behind my teeth. It was a fight to survive, but it wasn't just a single thing. They were all around me, on me, inside me. I slashed at them. Clawed, crushed, twisted and turned. Abe, I screamed. Abe, please. I remember lying on the floor, scraping them from my thigh, but having the knife slip from my bleeding hands over and over. Everything was stained with bloody handprints, and I'd lost all control of my fingers. My body seemed to be fighting itself. Everything looked red, but it was just the blood. I couldn't tell if it was in my eyes, or just everywhere. I remember Abe breaking in the front door, looking down at me, and screaming at the top of his lungs. I pointed at the knife. A Abe! Help! Help me scrape them! Help! Help me scrape! So yeah, he called the police. The ambulance. Anything with lights. I remember being covered in plastic and brought to the hospital. Someone shining a light in my eyes, putting pressure on my arm. Hold him down! They yelled. Hold him the fuck down! I blacked out as we rushed past the first set of traffic lights. They had to amputate two fingers. The index finger and middle finger of my left hand. The nerves were too damaged. Incidentally... These are the fingers I'd most used when playing the violin. I was put on three different kinds of medication. They shaved all my hair, including my eyebrows, and slathered me in some kind of cream. They had to stitch my arms in six different places. The place was fumigated. They told me it was a combination of lice and mites, and there was no option but to chemically kill everything. Hell. They fumigated Abe's place, too, just in case it had spread. Abe didn't seem to mind. He gave me a ride back from the hospital once I was back on my feet. He brought me a fresh pair of clothes and helped me get back home. As he held the door open, I was afraid to step back in. I felt so fragile. I imagined myself seeing little beetles in the gravel leading up to the door. Of course, it was all just pebbles but everything small and white made my skin crawl. But the place has been clean, obsessively clean. I've kept it as such ever since. Yes, I'm currently seeing a therapist, a remote specialist, Jane Bogan, some kind of phobia big shot. Fun fact, someone in the cleaning crew stole my presenda. It feels like I should say something, but I don't even know where to begin. I haven't gotten anyone to admit to the crime yet anyway. I'll get past this. Somehow. I know I will. But honestly, despite it all, I miss Mila and her curly, mocha-colored hair.